Drowned God Conspiracy of the Ages is a 1996 point and click adventure game by Epic Multimedia Group. It's a game of mystery, deception and intrigue. It proposes that human life was seeded by extraterrestrial aliens that subsequently directed and influenced our ancestors, culminating in grand, world-encompassing conspiracies by powerful groups to cover up the truth. That description, however, doesn't do this game justice because Drowned God is one of the strangest, most unsettling games that I've ever played. One, because of the game's actual content, and two, because of its enigmatic creator, Richard Horn, or Harry Horse, by his pen name. Now, Harry Horse has already been spoken about in depth by others, so I won't go into great detail about him. What I want to explore is the video game, but essentially he was a bizarre figure who ultimately led to an equally bizarre end. Born in England, he was a children's author, political cartoonist, singer and illustrator. In 1991, he married his then partner, Mandy, who was subsequently diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, a debilitating condition that left her wheelchair bound and terminally ill. The couple were found one night dead in their Shetland Island home. The newspapers initially reported it as a lover's suicide pact. Mandy, unable to bear the pain from her terminal illness, and Harry, unwilling to live without his wife, both decided to end their lives. It came out later, however, that Harry was bound to fits of rage and depression, a frequent drug user, and that the couple had been entertaining house guests hours before their death, with witnesses stating that Harry was roaming the house proclaiming it's a wonderful night for a killing. The details of the deaths emerged, and rather than a suspected drug overdose, Mandy had been found to have been stabbed more than 30 times, many of the wounds to her arms as she struggled to defend herself. Both the family cat and dog were found murdered, and Harry's arms and genitals had been slashed multiple times. Now, this story has no definitive explanation. By all accounts, the couple had a happy marriage, but it certainly recontextualizes one of Harry's last works of artistic creation, Drowned God, Conspiracy of the Ages. As mentioned, this is one of the strangest, most baffling atmospheric games that I've ever played, so let's begin. Welcome, my friends, to the Bequest Club. My gift to you. I have waited a long time for your return to this place. Many times have you lived before. Now step across the threshold and the boundaries of this locked door that separates this life from those before. And go amid the realms behind a word of warning, and then I go. Trust too deeply, and you will know the wickedness in men's hearts. As above, so below. As above, so below. This is the secret of the Drowned God. First things first, we need to read the manual. You'll have no idea what's happening without it and that's a short story to flick through that adds more context. The narrator tells us that he was given the bequest globe in an anonymous benefactor's will. That's what we're standing before now. The bequest globe gave the narrator the ability to experience his past lives, transporting him to various time periods that each held a mysterious historical artifact. To activate the bequest globe, you need to write your name on the ancient computer, which in turn bestows you with a sacred number and symbol. The manual tells you that if you forget the sacred number and symbol, you're screwed, so I hope you read the manual. You are the majestic, the golden cup, the sixth number. In you all the numbers are found. You are artistic, philosophical and wise. Mine was the number six and the female gender symbol. You know, this is actually pretty cool and it does make the player feel unique. We look through our previous incarnations as well as information on our lives and how we died. It's a really intriguing start. Drowned God basically plays the same as Mist or the Seventh Guest. You point in different directions to move, solve puzzles and keep items in your inventory. We enter the Bequest Globe and find a set of stairs that we can travel up or down. We travel down and find a sort of medieval room with a long table as well as a floating head. Number six, the Majestic, comes to market. The Majestic awakens from the dream, understanding, perceptive, brightest of all the nine. 
No secrets remain locked under your gaze. Where did you learn to fly? Find what cannot be found, and set the wheel in motion. Join us, and we will grant you all the gifts from the garden. You get the number 8 and walk back up the stairs to the top room. Inside is a modern secretive boardroom and another floating head. This is Keener number 6. We read you as wise and intuitive. These are qualities necessary for bringing this mission to an affirmative termination. At present, your memories are scattered fragments. They may or may not return to aid you this mission for retrieval. Other attempts at retrieval have been made, but all have ended in failure. You are the mission's last remaining hope that we might make our way back to the garden. Return here when you have found and installed the first relic. We get the number three. Both of these rooms house mysterious groups that want us to join them and work for them. In fact, we've been tasked with retrieving the mysterious relic. We travel back to the bequest globe and input the numbers on the computer. This diagram represents the Kabbalistic tree of life which in turn symbolises various aspects of God, existence and the human psyche. There are so many allusions in this game to real world religions, historical figures, events etc. I'll point them out as I see them but we'll be here all day if I try and go in depth on every single one. We activate the portal to Bina. We hit the number 2 on the bequest globe and this cool steampunk animation plays before transporting us to Stonehenge. Now this is a visually stunning level, it's dripping in atmosphere with a foreboding tone and equally mysterious background track. The passages in between the stones teleport you to different areas. The only issue I have is that you immediately get thrown into the deep end of the swimming pool, with little to no context as to what's happening, what you need to do or where to go. Naturally we go exploring around but it's easy to get lost here and turned around on yourself as most of the stone pillars look identical no matter what direction you're facing. We enter a room inside a gigantic armoured chest and discover the round table from Arthurian legend. On the back of one of the chairs is the first puzzle. You have to connect all the dots without crossing the lines. It's not too difficult but it does require some thought. This summons whatever the hell this is. Time to go. I, Sir Bedivere, did lift him up. I saw his guts fall from his body, the crow and the viper quick to seize a piece. This was a woman's treachery. Here may men understand that the quest for the Blessed Grail was our undoing, the round table destroyed and our knight slaughtered. Is this the promised Avalon? The battle done, the murder of our King Arthur? Who has betrayed us? Oh, my king is dead. Oh, my precious, please forgive me. The mist tells the story of the Knights of the Round Table and their ultimate undoing, as well as the location of the Holy Grail, I think. I'll try to make sense of everything that happens, but it's just my best guess. Some of the elements in this game are so bizarre and cryptic as to be really difficult to decipher. We enter through the next pillar and we get the Tower Tarot card. These cards are vital to progress in the game. We walk back into the Knight's armour and see a man in black interfacing with a spaceship before disappearing. On the ship we enter the female gender symbol we were given at the start of the game, click the holy grail switch to the right, press the symbol for Bina, and click the glowing button. Yes. 
Now, it would be really nice if we could hear what he's saying, but yeah, this is just the fatal flaw of a drowned god. There are no options and no way to reduce the volume of the background soundtrack. It's stupidly difficult to hear what characters are saying half the time. I'll try to clean up the audio a bit during the edit, but there's not much I can do. I'm actually hearing what a lot of these characters are saying for the first time while making this video, because I couldn't make it out while I was actually playing the game, and there's usually no way to restart the dialogue. Basically, the voice says that the Holy Grail is an alien relic that allows navigation through the temporal plane, like we've been doing via some of the Stonehenge portals. The spaceship reveals the secret basement, but that's not where we need to go yet. We traverse the portals until we end up in Merlin's Oak. We click the three drawers until we release the elemental. We head back to a stone wall and it lets us pass. We walk to the pier and see this absolute nightmare fuel. A boat arrives and we get on it and we sail to a tower on an island. We enter and see the reanimated body of the Knights Templar. We have to beat him at a puzzle game to continue forward and it reminds me of Indiana Jones. You must choose. But choose wisely. For as the true grail will bring you life, the false grail will take it from you. Basically we take turns placing a cart filled with poison or something similar on a game board. You take turns extinguishing the flames by pressing one of the five buttons on either side, and it extinguishes the flames in a cascade in order from whichever row you clicked. The knight goes first and you always lose the first round no matter what. When we lose, we have to drink. Drink twice and you're dead. Also, he insults us. Drink with oblivion. You are a moron. Thankfully, you can restart all these games by turning away from the board and coming back meaning you don't have to keep loading saves. By the time I managed to beat the knight twice in a row, both of us have drank so many cups that we would be dead a thousand times over. Now, we enter a coffin lift that takes us up or down. We go up to see Morgana Le Fay, the legendary sorceress from Arthurian legend. We get the star card and... time certainly hasn't been kind to her. I'm Morgana, the lady of the lake. In Arcadia, Arthur was my brother, and Merlin my lover. The seas burnt. There was terror on the land as the hills and the mountains sank from sight. To find the Grail, you must look to the stars. The gateway to the stars is calling us home. Then bring the star and the Babel me. From what I can tell, the Arthurian knights were aligned in some way with a sect of extraterrestrial aliens. Morgana has either been kept alive via genetic engineering and machinery, or she's an android of some sort, I, I think it's the former. We go to the basement and get treated to this absolutely banging soundtrack. There's a book here filled with lore and we place the tower card down to open it. I won't read the entire thing, but for the rest of the video, when stuff like this crops up, I'll edit in every page so you can pause it and read it at your leisure. Basically, it talks about the history of man and aliens, the great flood and how the pyramids hold the truth, the history of the Egyptian gods which were really ancient aliens. At the end, we're greeted to this absolutely amazing artwork. You can click on various parts of the artwork to reveal a hidden image underneath. Deepest Lore there's something so cosy about the graphics and the glow of the candles, I really do love this level. Right, so we walk into the next room and find the next puzzle. Two talking heads of Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein along with two doors. Each head will say a sentence at random when you enter one of the two doors at the back, and when you enter those doors you loop back around to the same room. Clicking the now button locks in a sentence, so basically you keep walking through the doors until you hear a sentence that would logically follow the previous sentence locking it in with the now button each time. What goes up must 
Unfortunately, you can't hear what they're fucking saying due to the background sound, so I'll just put it on screen now. We get a metal ball and Einstein tells us that the Holy Grail allows us to bend time to navigate to a specific point, which we already know. Next we go into Leonardo's workshop, which is in the basement underneath the spaceship. Yep, Leonardo da Vinci was part of this Arthurian secret society that knew about the existence of aliens. He's got a bunch of grass and books and drawings littered around his workshop. There's another puzzle here which requires the star card to activate. You need to match these numbers to a constellation coordinate map that was in a book on Leonardo's desk. We do it and we're treated to more sketches of alien spacecrafts, human to alien body modification, and the entire alien life cycle. No, not that alien life cycle. Afterwards, we get the star card back. Next, we have to bring the robot to life by placing the metal ball from our inventory in the chest. I... I hate it. Why has it got to look like that? He powers up the contraption for us which drops a babel cylinder on the ground. We go back to Morgana and give her the star card and place the babel cylinder in the machine, which activates whatever this is. We get the moon card and head back to the workshop and then through a secret tunnel. We walk through this dank, creepy maze in the dark and place our moon card in this glowing slot. This activates a light and we hear a clock ticking. Oh great, a time puzzle, I absolutely love these. Uh, what do we do here? The sliding blocks, symbols. Oh, it's literally just a game of matching the symbols. That was surprisingly easy. So then we're back in Stonehenge again and we have to set back every clock to the hour of our entry and a bunch of glowing portals are around. Again, thank god it's pretty easy, you basically just revisit all the areas that we've already been to. It's still a bit freaky but nothing too complicated. And that's it, we have the Holy Grail. Ah, oh, fuck, where did I put disc two? Right, so that's been our done, and before we go to the next world, we need to talk to the two floating heads again. We hit one or nine on the bequest globe and head downstairs. They tell us that we're being stalked by the enemy above, which is pretty ominous. The bloodline of the gods is safe. Know then that we who descend from the primordial seven, we who are born from the primordial flame, have learned from our fathers that this knowledge did not drown. The first relic is safe. What was lost is found. But be warned, your progress is stalked by the enemy above. They say that they want us to trust them, but they don't ever really say who the fuck they are or what they want. That's the major problem with this game's story, I think. It's just way too ambiguous, and often you only get an explanation for the world you were in after you've already completed it. You get the temperance card and chuck it into this box to reveal the painting. That's quite nice. All the world in here. Et in Arcadia Ego. From the Ark of Noah came forth the Manimal. We also get the number 8. Upstairs we talk to the other floating head and honestly this is my favourite room. 
This is where the game shines, the atmosphere, the foreboding tone. Something about this character and the organisation puts me on edge without needing to explicitly state anything. In my opinion, the Bequest Globe hub world should have only featured this single entity. You could have still kept all the weird, insane stuff, but just use this one entity to tie a stronger narrative thread between the worlds by giving you a mission and explaining where you're going. Then it would be up to you whether to trust them or not. But as it stands, I don't know who either of these two organisations are or what they actually want. Welcome, number six. You've done well. We knew that you would prove an excellent candidate for the mission. However, our operatives also inform us that you have made contact with the Nephilim. Now, this could prove difficult. There are certain loyalties that we expect, after all. Perhaps your curiosity can be forgiven in this case. However, if you wish to aid us, then we expect nothing more than your singular devotion to our cause. Many lives are at stake. We know that you will do the right thing. The next realm will not be so easy. Time is the key. Others have tried and failed because they did not realize this. Be careful who you trust. We look forward to your safe return to this lodge. That will be all. You get the magician card and use it to activate this map. We seem into England and then Stonehenge. In dormant state, Henge is Stone Age computer, capable of predicting lunar eclipses. Also astronomical calendar. Stones arranged to mark crucial points in cyclical movements of sun, moon, and stars. In active state, Stonehenge is temporal gateway to fifth dimension. Warning. In 1979, during Project Dragon, site inadvertently reactivated by Project Personnel during experiments involving high ultrasonics. Search for Project Dragon Personnel continues. It gives us full lengthy context for where we just were, but again it would have been better to get this info dump before or during the level. You get the number 4 and repeat the same steps as last time, this time clicking the top left of the square. We're off to, to Chessid, the, the drowned world. To, to Chessid, Chessid. the world is after, the world before. The first door. Again, what a cool animation. Oh fuck, I mean I have no mouth and I must scream. Mother ugly machine. Mission worth undertaking. So it brings me here, junkyard, electronic pyramid nowhere. Wait, no, no. So immediately we go down this cavern and go all around exploring. There's a bunch of temples and zero context to what the fuck you're doing or where to go first. It's exciting because there's an adventure in front of you, but at the same time, what the fuck do I do? Let's start with this puzzle. You click on an open hole and white dots fill the spaces around it. You need to fill the holes exactly without going over. This game's saving grace is that, while the navigation can be tricky, the puzzles themselves are solvable by a real human being. I like shit like Harvester. What are you doing, son? Playing Harvester. That thing? I looked at it the other day. The very thought. It's disgusting. It's cool. We beat the puzzle and get a golden ball. The next puzzle is kind of similar. Raising the stone slab makes other stone slabs fall. Just click around until you get it right. There's not too much to explain of either of these two puzzles. I absolutely love this. We are far from home. Lost. Never to return. Our signs are made. Our beacons built. The creatures here are primitive. And so we help them. But we do not harm them. No. Who will reign and who will serve? All ends in murder. So that's the first real clarification that we get for this game's title. At first I thought this was Egypt, but it's actually Mayan temples in ancient Mesoamerica. This sect of aliens, 
Their first well drowned, fell beneath the oceans, <coughs> Atlantis. <coughs> so they travelled to Mesoamerica and the ancient Mayans worshipped them as gods. We get the top half of a card. The next puzzle sounds easy but it's incredibly annoying. You just need to pick up these cards individually and walk over to a different pyramid to slot them into a statue. However, if you thought Stonehenge had a confusing layout then this one takes the cake. It's not even that complex, it's not meant to be a labyrinth or anything. But there's so few markers for where you are in relation to anything else. The sand looks the same, the mountains look the same and the pyramids look the same. In games like this you need to keep a constant mental note of where you are and where you came from. And if anything distracts you, even for a second, you're fucked. Right, here's your damn cards. I love you. The creatures here are primitive. But we don't harm them. For they are like children to us. We teach them all our secrets. I look for a wonder of blood moon. Murder was in my heart. The mirror smokes. From here he watches. I smell him in the darkness. Night axe and the flayed one running beside me. When the sun points the rod, sea becomes fire. We are far from home. Lost. Never to return. Our signs are made. Our beacons built in the hope of a rescue. What are they doing? Look at this elaborate setup. All of that just to make a little triangle come out of a statue's mouth. Well, time to jump down this creepy hole. Honestly, I got stuck for a pretty long time here. I had no idea where I was going or what I was supposed to do with this item. Well, you see that down by the far right? You yeah, bastards. That could be anything. It looks like the statue was designed that way. It doesn't look like something that is missing and needs this little triangle to go into. It's pretty cool how the room just opens up though, I do like that. There's a ton of elaborate designs on the walls and a skeleton resting on a table. Evidently, some kind of genetic mutation went on here. We walk up to get a better view of the floor in the next puzzle. This one is really fun. I imagine this game has to be something commonplace and not made specifically for the drowned god. You place a square down and then your opponent does the same. You have to connect three squares while stopping your opponent doing the same. After placing eight squares, you and your opponent can no longer place any more. You now take turns moving your square one space at a time to an open area, blocking your opponent and trying to connect three. When you connect three, you can choose one of your opponent's squares to remove. It looks really easy, but it's surprisingly challenging. It took me quite a bit of time to win and it was a lot of fun. Great puzzle. For winning, we get the bottom half of the Emperor card. The Genesis Rod is what we're here for. Next, we go for a walk in a dank, creepy catacomb. The sound is very subdued and when you're outside you feel like you're completely alone and it gives you this very melancholic feeling. It's like you're seeing something you're not supposed to. The activated device that requires the golden ball from earlier, it drains a pond and shows us the genesis symbol. You may have caught it appearing a few times throughout this video if you're very eagle-eyed. We take the ball back again and go up to this giant vat of liquid. Prepare yourself. Here she put me, a prisoner of the water. I am just a child, the last of my kind, the moon. Insane in her anger and jealousy, kills our emperor. She steals all the secrets. She sends the killer's night axe from the flame. The fire bird spits. The sun falls. Isis, he cries. Becomes our boat in the hope of rescue. We look to the stars to take us home. 
Creepy and cryptic. If you're confused and barely understand what's going on, well, me too. Remember that book from earlier? Well, it basically lays out the plot to this entire level. The Egyptian gods were actually the aliens that came to rule over the Mayans. The firebird, the rod, the cup and the stone are the relics that we're after. The Nephilim are the Mayans, I think, genetically altered by aliens. The Genesis rod can transmute physical elements into other elements, turn water into fire, for example. Then all this stuff about Horus, Osiris, etc. Well, Osiris took a human bride, Isis, I think. Horus got pissed off about it and tried to trick Isis, but she refused. So Horus took the firebird and the rod and killed Osiris, causing an alien civil war. Now, is that 100% correct? I honestly have no fucking idea. That's the best I've understood it. There is no in-depth plot explanation for this game anywhere. It doesn't exist, so I could be wrong, but I think that's what happened. You have to keep in mind that I couldn't hear the majority of this game's dialogue while playing the game. I don't quite understand why they're named after Egyptian gods when this isn't Egypt and we're dealing with the Mayans. Does this sinking pyramid represent Egypt where they originally came from? I just don't know. That's all I can really tell you. I don't know, and I can't go anywhere to find out. And this is Horus, according to him, so... I don't know if he was the Horus from back then or whether he's the new Horus, but according to him he's the last surviving alien. He tells us to choose life or death, kill him or let him live. Well, we'll let him live because we're not petty. Another card, and again, holding the Genesis rod. We go into this cave system and it just reminds me of Alien. This part is strange. We walk through a blinded light to see some kind of living organ. Pressing the buttons is just horrible. <laughs> It appears to be a machine to genetically modify human beings. We're inside a pulsating heart by the sounds of it. We walk across to the human body and activate the scanning machine. This puzzle involves finding each genesis symbol on their body and scanning it before the timer runs out. In return we get four tiny metal balls. We place the balls in this viscera and activate the computer. This computer is known as Noah because it's the ark that can alter human life into a variety of manimals as it refers to them. Frying the computer gives us another card. I assume this is Osiris and Isis. We place all our cards into the viscera and get teleported to... Ah oh Christ, this isn't a game you want to play in the pitch black at 3am, I tell ya. This is genuinely frightening. The juxtaposition between spending the last few hours in a bright open world environment to immediately being thrust into a dark labyrinth-like submarine with only the hum of the ship's engine in the background. Again, I was playing this at 3 in the morning, in the dark, exhausted after work, and all of this combined into one of the most effective jump scares I've experienced in quite a while. That scared the absolute hell out of me. You've seen this guy once before messing around with the spaceship, but only at a distance. In fact, almost everyone we interact with in this game is first viewable at a distance, or we're introduced to them in a cutscene, and the player is always the one to start the interaction, 
But with that, he's just right there in your face. Uh, he's just standing there. Menacingly! Get out of there, SpongeBob! Yeah. It might not have the same effect on you as it did on me. But keep in mind, I've just spent hours walking around by myself, completely alone up until now. Well, I'm definitely not going that way anymore. We enter the periscope room to find the frozen corpse of a man embedded in a metal pillar, his face contorted in agony. Not much that I can add to that. We take the key from around his neck and find a Morse code chart. This will obviously be useful for later. We go into some sleeping quarters and see a family photo and a Bible open on the page of Genesis. There's a telegraph machine where we can enter the Morse code. Let's take a guess. Hmm, Genesis. This unlocks the bathroom door behind us. Guess he really cared about his privacy. We enter the room in the pitch black, which is equally terrifying. The bathroom is actually another office, I think. That or he just likes to sit and write beside the toilet. The computer panel shows us the secret orders given to the crew of this submarine. They were trying to locate the Rod of Osiris. We've been warned that Pandora has been opened. We're treated to an info dump. I'll let you flick through, but basically the submarine was under direct orders of a shadowy government organisation, Magic 12 who set their new mission towards retrieving the rod. The secret government cloaking device has mentioned that, during its first use, accidentally caused its crew to vanish into thin air, freeze to death or burst into flames. Maybe the same happened to this guy. Apparently temporal windows were discovered across the Bermuda Triangle and Magic 12 had previously reverse engineered an alien spacecraft. Their organisational goals are to capture the alien relics and not allow them to fall into enemy or civilian use. They describe capturing and using Nazi technology during World War II, and on the last page is a memo to the captain that alien spacecrafts are aware of their mission and trying to stop them. There's a key on the back page, and that gives us two. Every door opening animation creeps me out now. We use the two keys on the coordinate retrieval machine. We turn around to see a portal to the Rod of Osiris on a grid pattern cage. We need to use the switches to locate the rod, the little ball on the map, and retrieve it. You have four moves to complete the puzzle, and the rod always starts in a different location every time you mess up. You're moving in the x-axis, z-axis and x-y-axis. Oh, and the rod always has to be facing upwards when it reaches the retrieval square. Now, if you're anything like me, then you'll probably break down in tears at this part because you're stupid. But it's actually not as bad as you imagine. You just set all the switches to zero before you start. Play around so you know what moves what. Don't concentrate on that glowing square, only the ball, that's what's going to move each turn. And always look back to the portal to see what direction the rod is facing. The upper left switch moves the dot one square to the right on the X axis. The lower left switch moves it one square along the Z axis. The upper right switch controls the X Y axis and moves it down one square to the right on the X axis and two squares up on the Y axis. The lower right switch controls the rotation of the rod. Yes, we got it. Now get me out of this damn submarine. Nice. Oh, for God's sake. And that was Chessid. Again, I really liked it. It's a bit similar to Sanitarium in the sense that you're visiting several distinct worlds. I enjoy how different they are to each other. Anyway, we press 1 on 9 on the bequest globe and go up and down as usual. As you may have guessed, the assembly down below are an Illuminati-like group who descended from the Knights of the Round Table and include historical intellectuals like Leonardo da Vinci, whereas the group upstairs are your typical men in black shady government agency figures. The game explains that all worldly mythology comes from ancient aliens who stranded themselves on Earth. Their kingdom, Atlantis, drowned. Osiris was the emperor, the drowned god, and Horus murdered him. I think. Anyway, Horus plays a kind of Prometheus figure who brought alien knowledge to the human race. Maybe. What does the cybermorph floating head have to say? We honour you, and show our love through the signs. When the hour strikes for Our Lady to be crowned Queen of all the world, you will stand with us. 
the secret of the drowned god shall be known to you. Under the sign of the crown, the technocrats, the industrialists, those who worship the machine, those who would have us yoked in the harness of this technology, will fall as the last trumpet sounds. Men hide Our Lady's face and guard the entrance to the truth. As above, so below. As after, so before. More vague, cryptic nonsense. Just once I'd like a straight answer out of these guys. We get the Empress card and use it to look at another historical painting. Very nice. We get the number 9 and walk upstairs to see what these jokers have to say. Congratulations, number 6. Another successful completion. Perhaps all the pieces are beginning to fit into place. But you still have many questions, don't you? You see, my friend, the battle is not for the Earth but for the minds of the men and women of the planet. And time is not on our side. We have had to make certain eliminations to preserve this secret. Sometimes life is cheap when the future salvation of many is put at risk. John F. Kennedy knew this, and that's why he was removed. Turns out that this agency killed JFK. I much prefer these guys as the main shadowy villains. Your continued visits to the Nephilim Lodge cast doubt upon the alliance we expect from you. Before you go, I'll give you an example. A new world order lies around the corner. Oh dear god, don't mention the phrase new world order. When was this game made again, 1996? It's crazy to think how ahead of their time they were considering the prevalence of conspiracy theories nowadays. Even stranger to think that the creator of this game died in such bizarre circumstances. Nothing else in the video game industry quite compares to the drowned god. Mandatory microphones in every home. A surveillance system that monitors the actions of every citizen on the planet. Virtual prison camps. Mind control. If this is the world you want to build, then the Nephilim will provide you with the building blocks. We know that you will do the right thing. That is all. We get the High Priestess card and slot it in to get an info spill on where we just were by the incredibly flamboyant sounding AI. Pyramid of the Sun, dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, one of original refugees, Pyramid of Moon, also named House of Secrets, and Smaller Temple of Venus, together commemorate fatal alignment of celestial bodies which caused destruction of Atlantis. Pyramids also constitute rescue beacon, viewable only from air, in conjunction with Nazca plane markings. We grab the number 5 and run back to chuck it in the computer. This time we're off to... let me check my notes... Din. The darker half of your soul now walks with him in Din. The wheel turns 4, then 15 more. The temple opens, the book adores. Jerusalem made with iron and steel, the earth realm on the crypto wheel. In Din, the Death Star. In Din. Now, would you believe me if I told you this was the strangest world in the game? Stranger than anything you've seen thus far. There are so many interesting details and pieces of art in this room. Just have a look around and take it all in. It's what really elevates this game to a whole other level. There's a table featuring the man in the iron mask, another real historical conspiracy that will come up again later. The first puzzle is just above. You need to guide this little train to the end. It can pass through green barriers but not red, and they switch whenever you move a space. It's not too difficult, not too easy. In return you get the chariot card. We fall through a trap door in the floor and end up in this bizarre rotating room. It's basically just a trial and error puzzle. Check the number on the room you enter to see whether you're making progress. We continue on and see this eccentric old man wandering around. 
We follow him as he pops up in random spots. Ah, yes, a stone. Let me success a severe stone. I can't hear any of that. I'll beast it for you, but for me it was basically inaudible. What was I saying? Ah, the vampire, yes, a spill of subconscious production of the doppelganger. Dangerous, yes, very yes, the stone's influence causes the personality to stay. It's quite a strange experience. It goes on for a fair amount of time and you're constantly waiting for something ominous to happen. You're the first one I've seen down here for a while. What was the other name? Big fellow, not a scabbard hair on his head, looking for a jack of order, maybe. No, you're not Mavis, are you? No, no, I thought not. Name escapes me for a moment now. Where was I? Eventually he splits into two and one of them kills the other. He drops a book in a hand. We continue forward to discover an old-timer European amusement park You can hear voices but nobody is around. It's so unexpected and darkly lit that, as always, it's creepy. We enter the theatre of memory and take stock of our surroundings. There's a poster advertised in Alistair Crowley who was a famous English occultist, magician and writer that founded his own religion. A strange man to say the least. I'd highly recommend reading about him if you aren't aware. Next is a poster for Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, an acclaimed intellectual of the human mind. Over here we have... Um, well, anyway, we walk upstairs and see Carl Jung's memory test. There's even this cool amusement exhibit. Professor Carl Jung made his study of the human mind his life's work. He investigated the paranormal, shamanic magic, and the study of ufology, as well as symbology and the psychoanalytical interpretation of dreams. He regarded the ancient root memory of our ancestors as the key to understanding our primitive emotions. I was stumped when I saw this, but it's actually really simple. Make a random combination and pull the lever. The display will tell you how many are correct or in the wrong place. Trial and error. Part of me appreciates the fairly simple, straightforward and even sometimes easy puzzles, but I think it might frustrate the majority of players. It's not to say the game is easy, however. On the contrary, the navigation and order in which you need to complete certain actions can be downright intolerable to figure out. For winning, we get this. My name is Professor Carl Jung. Perhaps you have heard of me. In the real world, I was a psychologist and made my life's work the study of the human mind. The human mind is split into the two sides of the conscious and unconscious. The house is a good symbol for this theory. Upstairs is the conscious mind. The room is light and airy. As we descend the stairs into the darker floors of the house, down to the basement, we find the unconscious side of the mind. Ancestral races, collective memories. When wild creatures hunted us for their meat, murder, animal frenzy, the forces of evil unchecked. You must choose when the time arrives between the two sides of the mind. If you free the doppelganger, then your actions will be judged in the end accordingly. I can help you. And in the dream, you must ask yourself, are these my saviors or my jailers? And a book on flying saucers. Around the corner is Alistair Crowley's machine. Alistair Crowley was regarded in his day as the most dangerous man on earth. Crowley responded by naming himself the Great Beast, and his notorious sexual habits and magical practices soon earned him the infamy that he sought. He formed the Golden Dawn with McGregor Mathers in 1924, gathering around him some of the literati of the day, including W.B. Yeats and Arthur Machin. In 1927, at Bolskin Lodge, Loch Ness, Crowley and Mathers performed a ritual in the top tower, summoning up a league of demons. So bad was this encounter that Mathers was left for dead, and Crowley disappeared and did not reappear for several days. Nothing can compare to an English eccentric. Let's get this started. What a clever child. How nice to see you. Oh, how interesting. Please come forward and listen carefully. Give me your hand and I'll tell you secrets. 
On one hand, I love this next part, and on another, what the absolute fuck is this? Am I the king of depravity? The lord of the flies? The wickedest man in the world? You must know and you will. Place the hand on the symbol. This is the hand of a god. This is the relic hand of the giant Osiris, the last of the sons of God. Oh, priests, weep in this knowledge. What secrets have you burned in the library to keep this truth hidden? We crashed on this earth, far from home. Our signs made in the hope of rescue. The lifeline stops. What? Actually, it's this. The conspirators meet the master of the temple. The firebird spits. Osiris, the god, falls wounded to the ground. Cut up his head, says Horus. You know when you see something for the first time and you instantly know it's going to be seared into your memory forever? Every time I think of the Drowned God, I'll think of that face in this room with this music. An absolute nightmare. We get the Book of Lies. From what I understand, we're after the Philosopher's Stone. We walk back to the creepy mannequin doll things and read some notes inside their chest. They tell the story of Alistair, presumably Alistair Crowley, who completes a ritual to enter Din in search of a terrible crystal and then becomes lost in the labyrinth therein. Time has no effect upon him and he wanders Din alone for the rest of eternity. We received a justice card who has her breasts out for some reason. Would you believe it if I told you Din has an elaborate steampunk subway system? For the next hour or so we'll be traversing this subway completing a number of puzzles and quotations. We travel to a steampunk room with a guy in a diving suit messing around with a computer in the background. We fiddle with these controls until he walks over to scold us and then descends below the floor. We travel all the way back to the room you started in to get a printed code. How do you know you need to come here? You don't. So I walked around for an hour confused. The 90s point and click classic, having no idea where to go or what to do. We put the books we've collected into the bookshelf to reveal a hidden room. There's posters for all the relics on the walls along with their code names. We go back to the subway and back to the weird room with all the dials. This time with a code to correctly solve them. Completing it causes the diver suit guy to pop back up and pull a lever which does this. What did that accomplish? 
Again, back on the subway system, but this time we transport it to the inside of a trailer home. Absolutely banging soundtrack. It's really, really good, but I can't find a full list of the tracks anywhere online. It's such a shame. Here we have a computer hacking puzzle. Again, it looks complex, but it's fairly simple. You connect all the matching symbols without crossing the lines. The end screen will basically look like this. It's fun, but unoriginal. We get the hermit card for completing it, giving us three cards in total. This gives us access to the computer, which supposedly would connect to an online web page if your computer had an active internet connection. It's pretty cool, but this feature doesn't exist today, so we can only access the game's simulated web pages. Wait, what's this number on the next page? Call for game hints. I tried it, but none of them work. Imagine calling a stranger in 1996 and discussing this absolute insanity with them. This computer has one of the largest information dumps in the game, all for Majestic 12, the top secret government agency. We know the passwords from the relics on the wall earlier. I'm going to have to condense this as quickly as possible, but maybe grab a cup of tea because this could take a while. Right, here we go. Genesis, the Rod of Osiris. Aliens visited Earth, the Moon and Mars over 10,000 years ago. The Martian moon, Phobos, is an artificial orbital station. A civil war broke out between the ancient alien factions which resulted in the destruction of the 10th planet in our solar system. The surviving aliens came to Earth and genetically modified the indigenous population into an autonomous workforce, Homo sapiens. The alien continent of Atlantis flourished until two large fragments from the destroyed 10th planet collided with Earth and sunk the continent. Humans got to live a few thousand years without alien interference and secret groups formed to protect or abuse alien knowledge. Majestic 12 chooses to hide this earth-shattering truth from the human population in a huge complex global conspiracy. Each relic holds an incredibly rare element, element 115, which can turn 100% of matter into pure energy. This page shows all the information regarding the relics and their previous retrieval attempts by Majestic 12. The Holy Grail allows navigation through the temporal zone, the Genesis Rod transmutes elements, and the Philosopher's Stone is a power source that generates nuclear fission. Majestic 12 have no information on the last relic, the Ark. The Holy Grail, Lost Angels. There's a bunch of information on the creation of Majestic 12, the Roswell incident and recovered alien images. There's a history of Majestic 12's encounters with aliens. A number of alien bodies they recovered in a crash were booby-trapped with viruses, including AIDS and toxic shock syndrome. The frightening reality of this information would be that the US government stigmatised the homosexual community despite knowing that AIDS was of alien origin. The next page is on Leonardo da Vinci and their realisation that he was in contact with aliens. They're the same images we saw in the workshop. The next is a collection of video evidence, I'll play that in its entirety. I want to believe. Next up is the Philosopher's Stone, Majestic. There's rogue elements within Majestic 12 who have been circulating top secret information. Majestic 12 believes their intentions are to alert the general populace to the existence of aliens on this planet and to subvert their operations for their own purposes. They're known as the Avery and are attempting their own relic retrieval programs. Illuminated 9 control international media corporations, central government organised crime etc while Majestic 12 control international military intelligence. I'm not entirely sure what the Illuminated 9 are, perhaps it's the governing body above Majestic 12? I'm not sure. The hacker has managed to gain access to Majestic 12 systems. John F. Kennedy planned to go public with Majestic 12's information on alien life and implement criminal proceedings against those that covered it up. Majestic 12 had him assassinated. The US government accidentally detonated element 115, causing a nuclear explosion which killed some of their top scientists. They subsequently covered it up and arranged for future tests to be conducted in space. 
Majestic 12 abducted civilians at random across the globe for genetic modification testing. Absolute bastards. The US government intended to terraform Mars using Element 115 and turn it into a full life-sustaining ecosystem. Majestic 12 intended to hire more scientists after the nuclear accident. These documents show their intentions to indoctrinate them, as well as using cloned fetuses to be reared inside human female hosts to be used to operate alien spacecrafts. Unwilling mind-controlled female hosts. Also, anyone who breaches security protocols are executed immediately without trial. And to top it off, Majestic 12 are currently in contact with off-world aliens and have created a treaty in which aliens help protect the Earth against stray asteroids caused by the destruction of the 10th planet. In return, humanity must achieve total unification and globalisation by 2025 before being allowed advanced off-world space facilities. And Majestic 12 are allowing 144,000 human beings to be abducted by aliens for genetic testing. Selected DNA will be extracted into clone banks for future genetic reconstruction. Wait. Oh god. Oh no. Only now do I realise how ironic my name really is. Next, Firebird, the Ark. There's information on various cults which I believe are all real. It's kind of spooky when it crosses over into the real world, honestly. The next document is titled Project Freeman. Drowned God came out two years before Half-Life 1 and it features the silent, mysterious man in a suit that you can see wandering around various levels. Hmm. More government information, cover-ups, etc. Apparently the UK government used mind control technology to get the public to vote for the Tory Conservative Party. That I can believe, to be honest. More genetic testing, creating telepaths and telekinetics, etc. And an interesting chronological list detailing dates in the history of Majestic 12. I'll flick through this quickly. It's a really interesting read, but it'll take me an eternity to summarise. At the end, a new world order. A staged alien invasion is planned to herald a totalitarian state, eradicating all international borders. The film Independence Day is released to prepare the public. I'm really surprised this game isn't a thousand times more popular. But that's it. We're done with that huge information dump. And again, this should have been sprinkled out throughout the earlier levels, not chucked in your face in the last 20% of the game. It is an amazing work of fiction, however. You could read a whole novel based around this lore. The depth of its conspiratorial and historical knowledge is immense, far beyond anything that I know. It's absolutely bizarre and bewildering that its creator, Harry Horse, died in such violent, mysterious circumstances when explicitly discussing so many conspiracies and cover-ups within this game. We transported back to the subway system. That was one of the hacker's hideouts that we were just in. We go back to the arsehole in the diving suit and give him one of our cards which causes him to raise a little building out of the ground. We travel back to the secret room and place another card down which reveals yet another secret room. Pulling the lever activates a steampunk train and we pretend we're playing one of the DLCs for Train Simulator. Back to the secret room to reveal Baphomet, a big metallic head. Entering the code 555 activates him and he has one of the coolest voices in this game. Who wakes back for me? Fix me. Make an old man happy. And I'll tell you some more. Something to dull the consciousness in this heel bar of the soul. We fix him by pumping this syringe on his head. False messiahs come with new vistas of a promised paradise. Leading the flock to the slaughter. As the new Jerusalem is built with coal and steel, so turns the wheel. Dead to the world, if only we knew it. Blissfully unaware of the fate in store for us. You come to learn our secret. Fix me, and I'll tell you some more. We have to pump this syringe a few times. I don't really know what this is. Is he a decapitated head kept alive in the machine? I'm not sure. Did you think that a secret that was guarded from Atlantis to Egypt down through the twelve tribes, from Moses to Solomon to the Shambhala Monastery, to the Messiah and the Madonna, to the Holy Lodge, the Knights Templar, the Priory of Sion, the Rosy Cross, the Bavarian Illuminati, the 33 levels of Freemasonry stored in the buried vaults of the Vatican would be so easily given to you. Who do you think you are? Who are you? Why would I tell you anything? You must choose between
between good and evil, which betrayer, which betrayed, then unite the stone with me. He says some disturbing things, but it does go on forever. He wants us to come back with two pieces of the Philosopher's Stone so he can reunite them. Well, let's do that. Below the Theatre of Memories is one of the coolest parts of this game. The mysterious and wonderful Comte de Saint-Germain appeared in the courts of France around 1743, claiming to have arrived from the mounted monasteries of Tibet, where he declared that he had lived with immortals. A friend to humanity, he tried to prevent the French Revolution, prophesying that France would suffer a deluge of blood unless the monarchy changed its cruel policies and treatment of the poor. But his warnings were ignored by the French aristocracy. The court wrote, The time is fast approaching when imprudent France, surrounded by misfortune she might have spared herself, will call to mind such hell as Dante painted. Saint-Germain's high-degree masonry, his Templar and Rosicrucian connections, kept his enemies at bay until his arrest was called for by Morapa in 1778. He vanished in front of the arresting officers, and from that time, claims of his immortality spread across Europe. He left a final message for his would-be captors. My hands are tied by someone who is stronger than I am. I have only a limited time to give to France, and when that time has passed, I shall be seen again after three generations. So foreboding and disturbing. He gives us part of the stone and we go to retrieve the next part. We have to travel through this disgusting, squelching room that reminds me too much of Harvester. We fall into a trap door in the room and go sliding down into a disgusting flesh-covered hole landing in a gooey tunnel. Oddly enough, this is now the second game I've talked about where you walk around inside of a dodgy looking tunnel. We reach the man in the Iron Mask, again, a real historical figure I highly recommend you read about after this. The Man in the Iron Mask, made famous by Alexandre Dumas. The identity of the Man in the Iron Mask has remained one of the best kept secrets in history. King Philip of France kept the prisoner detained until his death, his identity hidden even from the jailers locked behind a full-face iron mask. Who was the man in the iron mask? Some say that the poor creature was the king's twin brother. Others that it was none other than the immortal Le Comte de Saint-Germain. Recently, it was claimed that the man in the iron mask guarded a secret. A treasure so great that it cost him his freedom and eventually his sanity. We shall never know who the prisoner really was, and why his identity had to remain such a closely guarded secret. He gives us the second stone. Just listen to that music. We go back to Baphomet to reunite the Philosopher's Stone. You must choose between the iron and the We use our last card to choose between the two. It has no effect on the game. None of the choices do. I'm not sure what their purpose is. Maybe it's just to freak you out. Nothing from nothing. We get the completed Philosopher's Stone. we're back. You know what, it feels good to be out of Din, that was a really long one. We're nearly there though, very, very close. There's this Drowned God the making of video and it's the strangest thing I've seen. Everyone comes off really awkward like they're being held against their will or don't want to be talking about it. The whole mystery of Drowned God is based on um, Atlantis, 
and the position of these star constellations that form the same constellation as the Giza pyramids, the, the, the ground layout. It's a puzzle game. Basically, it, the whole thing is unlocking a gigantic secret. Um, and the game is thought about as a, as a long crescendo from near ignorance into initiation and a new knowledge, which is genuine. You leave the game significantly with more between your ears and in your heart, maybe, than you had when you started it. I believe that Eden refers to Atlantis. This is all left of field stuff, I, I know that, but it happens to be what I believe in. There's a strange layer of something uncomfortable here, I think. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it. I highly recommend you go watch it for yourself, it is really interesting. There's also something I've forgotten to ask myself and that's, what the hell happens after we get the four relics? As always, press 1 or 9 on the request globe and go talk to the jokers on either side of the stairs. They must have something interesting to say now. An excellent mission under stressful conditions. You have done well. Our trust in you has increased and we are pleased with your continuing progress in the relic retrieval mission. As you have seen, these artifacts are more powerful than conventional modern technology. The ancient world, as we can see through legend analysis, is far different from what was held to be true. The human race did not evolve through the conventional Darwinian process. We were manipulated genetically by visitors and given a chance to reap the benefits of their technology. You have found what was feared to be lost forever. Imagine the world that we can create with such a technology. A world free from pollution and disease. A world united in a common goal. The preservation of peace in the new utopia. The right of the individual to live in harmony, free from the shackles of the industrial world. We can create heaven on earth with the assembled relics. When you have installed the ark into the crypto wheel, return to us and choose the paradise behind our door. The world we make together depends on trust. Trust us. You have found the secret. Soon, we will show you the truth. Somehow, I don't believe these shadowy government agents have ultimate freedom in mind. We get the devil card just in case the darkly lit, ominous boardroom wasn't enough of a hint that these guys are evil. We get the number six and pop downstairs. Reside, chosen one, in this the hall of our mother, the creator of the human race. The broken stone is made whole. This was the prophecy made in the Book of the Dead. And the creatures of the earth shall worship, not with love for the machine, but in the spirit. Isis gave us all the gifts. Now she comes again. A message of love for the earth tribes. Know then, that the path is lit with many stars. I'm more tempted to trust these guys because the woman's voice is kind of sexy and sultry, but I already fell into that trap with Shodan, another floating head, and I don't want to get my balls stomped on again. Idiot. Did she just call me an idiot? Look, jokes aside, you wouldn't be remiss for thinking this group is supposed to be the good guys, considering how evil the alternative is. But remember what we were told at the beginning of the game. A word of warning, and then I go. Trust too deeply, and you know the wickedness in men's hearts. We get the death card and chuck it in for another painting. Good stuff, I love it. We get the number seven, and you know the drill. Chuck it into the bequest globe, click the bottom right of the square, and get ready for the last world with the last relic, Chokma. The wheel turns to Chokma, fire in the desert. Turns to Chakma, fire in heaven. Six, then six, then six again. The wheel turns and Babylon burns. Press number four on the bequest globe and brace yourself for whatever horrors we're going to see this time. Oh no, it's America! More specifically, Area 51. There's even a diner right outside in a trailer home. 
The blood red sky gives this world a kind of hellish motif. You walk inside the trailer home. The hell is that? Ugh. It looks identical to the one in Din, I'm not sure if that's intentional or if they just ran out of time to design something different. Either way, it's the hacker's home. There's a voicemail on the phone. Oh, you've got to get past the hanging man. I, I don't have time to elaborate. The field has opened. They did come in after the Philadelphia 47 project. It's all in the Tesla notes. Something happened on board the Scorpio in 68 and the field opened for a second time. Pandora's box is open. They've got a deal. They're using us like cattle, bartering us for weaponry, advanced propulsion, chemical warfare. Find the hanging man. I, I've got to go. This line's no longer secure. They're listening. They know. In the city of lost angels. It's a lonely life, isn't it? I really like this part, it's got a very X-Files feel. I wish there was more audio recordings throughout the game. I never want to see that face again, especially on a pillow. It looks like the hacker was collecting information on all the wells we visited. Getting here makes you feel like you've stumbled into the middle of a cat and mouse chase and you're about to be pounced upon at any moment. Here's a fair warning because I'm nice. Get ready to have a heart attack at another unexpected jump scare. 3, 2, 1. It's so silly, but it scared the absolute hell out of me. I legitimately jumped back out of my seat when I saw that, heart pounding. You have to play this game for hours at a time in complete isolation with nothing like that happening at any point before to realise how unexpected it is. We look into this x-ray device to see that we have a bloody implant embedded in our brain. I assume it's how the man in black has been so hot on our heels this entire time. We have to deactivate it by taking turns moving this white eyeball. After each turn, the AI will move the blue eyeball one space. You have to move our white eyeball beside the blue eyeball and then take it over. It's kind of like playing drafts, but with a single piece. I like to imagine that we rip it out of our nose like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Total Recall. We go out and we move towards the diner. A bright light moves across the road. I have no idea what that was. Oh damn, the phone's ringing. Ah, oh, this is so bizarre. You know something is about to happen at any moment. I like the majority of the other levels. Things are moving, people are watching you, you feel hunted. There's this radio dream machine that plays a station with a hacker, I think, and the woman on the voicemail are being interviewed. Now, you're saying that aliens have infiltrated our government and are now running the country. <laughs> Boy, that's some claim. Does the president know all about this? Yeah. I sure as hell never voted a little green man into office. Or should I say, little green president? Uh, we have proof as far back as 1963 that uh, the American military cut a deal with the Greys uh, in return for certain technological advancements. There uh, are certain secret classifications that not even the president is privy to. Uh, you'll find that President Clinton tried to open these classifications in his first meetings with the military on the Star Wars project. He uh, found out that the weaponry was not aimed at the Soviets, but it was aimed outwards to the stars. We could just don't be their harvest. Don't you think they're going to help us? They don't hurt us. They're, they're like doctors. They have feelings of kindness towards us. They, they, they feel like we do. They... They are coming, for they are legion! Oh, wait! This is getting out of hand here. We're gonna take a break now. We're gonna be right back, okay, with this nut-fucking-nutcase. By tuning the channel, we hear whatever this is. My name is Edgar Case. In the real world, I was a healer. They called me the Sleeping Prophet, because in my dreams, I could travel to the past and the future. Those that destroyed Atlantis are here again. Good and evil entities, here to fight the last battle. The Armageddon. Alright, enough nonsense. There's just so much. What? What? 
just a crazy man talking. But I've seen things. They want breeders. <laughs> Build up the stock. We're all dead now. I've seen them. Now you got it. This pig man wants our last cards. Okay, whatever. In exchange, he gives us the judgment card and disappears. Sometimes we all got to die a little. Oh Jesus, what? We're back at the bequest globe. What happened? We didn't get the last relic, right? Did I die? You press one or nine in the bequest globe and go talk to the Cybermore floating heads. You have failed, number six. You have failed to install the final artifact in the crypto wheel. Our operatives report that the cloned entity created by the Nephilim removed you forcibly from the realm. Behind the door, you will find the necessary strength that will prepare you to take this final artifact. We will prepare you for the revelation. There is no plan for a totalitarian state. Humanity was never created to wear chains. Those who would have you believe that the human spirit can endure the shackles of the state without eventually breaking free are already subject to a greater evil. In Malkut, the worship of the satanic force has brought about the collapse of reason and humanity. If you seek to enslave the human race, then this must be your choice. We will fight against you to the last dying breath to preserve our freedoms. Choose wisely. The fate of humanity rests upon your decision. Take us back to Osiris. The Father the Son, the Holy Spirit. We will unlock the gates of the garden together. You find this all a little hard to believe, don't you? You are correct in your assumptions. There are no flying saucers, no recovered extraterrestrial bodies. You have seen the smoke screen. We will show you what exists behind that smoke screen. Step behind the door and see for yourself. Now, closer. Ever closer. The temptation to believe, but the implausibility of it all. How, you say, how could one group of people have kept a secret so large? A secret so vast that it would descend through the centuries unnoticed, undetected, undiscovered. The dust of the ages settling on the secret, known only to the initiated, to the elite, non-blabbers, the perfect spy. Now, the truth. There is no secret, no conspiracy. Your assumptions were correct. There is no conspiratorial web, no plotting groups of masterminds hell-bent on the enslavement of humanity. There is only the ragged march of chaos. All the world in chaos. All hail Discordia. This game honestly makes you feel like you're going insane. So they're saying they want us to join them to prevent the creation of a totalitarian slave state before going stark raving mad at the end there. But there is no conspiracy? But what is the truth? They give us the sun card which we use to open the secret room. Inside we get the strength card and a final door. Before we make any decisions, let's go downstairs and see what these guys have to say. Majestic, you have failed us. The Chosen returns empty-handed to the Lodge of the Nephilim. The Man in Black, a creation of the demonic forces in the Kether Lodge, stopped your progress. Where then the Ark of the Covenant, container of the sacred firebird, weapon of Osiris, the weapon that destroyed the first world? Are you willing to sacrifice all for the greater good? Are you ready to make that final sacrifice? Only the Wheel of Fortune knows how the game will end. Behind the door, we allow you to take the card and make your choice. The salvation of the world rests with you. How will you choose? If you go above, then the future hell that the Illuminati has promised will be made. The relics that you have installed are enough to bring this world to hell. 
Through us, all roads lead to hell. Know then the future hell planned for you if you should choose to betray Isis. Already the corporations are feeding your children, the future robots who will work the machine. Your every need will be catered for in this brave new world, but you will be dead in everything but the flesh and will not feel it. And those above, the Illuminati, they who destroyed the first world, will destroy the second. Walk with us. Be strong. We are going back to the garden. This card shows you the world we will make. This card shows her face. Isis. It's difficult to understand who these groups are. They're both constantly lying. They're both incredibly cryptic. There's obviously some kind of perceptible difference in the two groups that one represents technology, control and oppressive order, whereas the other represents vague allusions to humanity, nature and the collective. We get the world card, which I wish gave me that kind of power. I wouldn't put anything past Ground God at this point. We use it to open a secret room wherein we get the Wheel of Fortune card. Now we just need to decide who to decide with. Okay, okay, let's just make a choice. Let's put our lot in with these guys. There's a genetic mutation pod in here and the man in black. <laughs> oh no, we've been fooled. And when Horus found that Isis would not aid him betray Osiris, he plotted with his conspirators to kill our lord. He took the firebird, the rod, and slew him. This is the first truth, and is the testimony of Baphomet. And a great cry went up to heaven when it was learned that our Lord was dead and would not walk in the garden again. Then brother fell on brother and fought like beasts and slew those they most loved. Even their wives and children were not spared the sword. Much blood was spilt to his name and the suffering was terrible. So great was the love they had for Osiris. This is the last part of Genesis. The history of the people of Isis, the Nephilim. And the secret remains that men have kept the identity of the goddess hidden. Though her signs are everywhere if you have eyes to see them. Here ends the first garden. Though this paradise shall come again. For the world goes on. That was one ending, a man in black overlooking human beings in pods to be genetically mutated against their will, Melchart. Let's go back to the shadowy organisation and use the card to enter. It's a cold metallic prison with an Illuminati eye. Somehow I don't think this is the better choice. <laughs> the full card again. The same voiceover plays as before. The key for ending results in a technocratic totalitarian police state watched over by ominous men in black. You can hear the screams of the tortured in the background of this dystopian society. Honestly, it looks like the game was rigged from the start, but there's got to be another option, right? Right? Well, we can go back to the bequest globe, reject both lodges and place our cards inside the crypto wheel. The light, it's blinding! And that's it, the Drowned God Conspiracy of the Ages. I believe that the third ending represents embracing our alien creators, embracing the truth rather than running from it via the illusion of human control. 
But what is there to say about all this? How do you sum it up? It's one of the most obscure PC games ever made, practically lost to the ebbs and flows of time just like the alien knowledge within the story itself. It's epic in the scale of its world building, story and artwork. The creators of The Drowned God were obviously highly educated, incredibly artistic and creative pioneers that made one of the most unique video games that I've ever played. The reviews upon its release were pretty unforgiving and despite my praise it is easy to see why. The puzzles were often too simple whereas the navigation required to progress is often too vague and unforgiving. The vast majority of The Drowned God is incredibly cryptic and you only get a sense of what's happening near the end. And as you've seen, I still only have a rough idea of the overall plot and backstory. The game has a pretty steep barrier to entry but it's not impossible and it just requires you to stick with it. And as I previously stated, the artwork, the music, the atmosphere is all top notch. If any 90s PC game was worthy of a remaster to gain popularity in a new fan base, it's this one. Despite its problems, this should have been considered one of the classics and it's a damn shame that it isn't. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for sticking with me if you made it this far. There's plenty of other strange and surreal games to check out on my channel. I'd highly recommend taking a look at them if you're so inclined. Thank you again guys, I'm glad we can finally get this game out there in this crazy conspiracy- What? Who are you? What? I, I didn't know. I won't upload it, I promise. Wait, stop! Sometimes we all got to die a little.